Right, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, good. Um, good afternoon. I'm Richard Biggs, a solicitor at Irwin Mitchell. Um, I'm going to talk to you about expert witness work today. I'm conscious that um, we'll have a wide variety of experience in the room, so some of you may be very new to expert witness work. Some of you may have a wealth of experience, so I'm going to try and cover as much as I can, really, within the time allotted, in particular to have something for everybody. Um, I got back from holiday about three weeks ago from Portugal, lovely two weeks, and last night I was flicking through my holiday photographs, a couple that I just didn't like at all, and I said to the kids, I said, why do I look so old on these photographs? And my seven-year-old, as quick as a flash, said, that daddy is because you are so old. <laughs> and that is what expert witness reporting is about, about transparency, about offering a clear opinion on the facts in front of you. Um, maybe not from a seven-year-old, but... Uh, but I'm going to demonstrate, I hope, in this, in this presentation, just how important it is to be clear, transparent, honest, um, and, uh, and really get into the expert witness process, get out with your reputation intact, and, and get paid for doing the work. Um, so, introduction, I'm going to cover three areas today. Um, briefly talk about the litigation process itself. Um, I'll talk then about the role of the expert witness and the CPR. The CPR is a civil procedure rules, and they're the rules that govern... Uh, medical negligence claims, personal injury claims, any civil litigation. Um, and then finally, some pitfalls and tips, especially for those who, who may have experience of giving evidence in court. Um, what I've seen very recently is, is a focus by the judiciary in these types of cases on the impartiality of experts. And I'm going to, to demonstrate that with a few cases, actually, and, and show just, just how judges are really focusing, and in particular the last six months, on independence and, and, and absolute transparency of experts. So, the litigation process. Well, I always say to my clients at the outset of a case, is there's three things in a case we, we have to show. We have to prove, number one, there was an accident. Number two, we have to prove that the accident was caused by somebody else's fault, so uh, negligence or liability. And number three, we have to prove that the injuries were caused by the accident, and that's called causation, and that's the bridge between the accident and the injuries, and that's where the expert comes in with the causation. Put simply, we cannot succeed, as lawyers cannot succeed in winning a case without the input of an expert and an expert's report. The role of expert's evidence. Now, the civil procedure rules is very prescriptive um, in, in what um, expert evidence should contain. If you're, you're new to report writing, it's essential that you read part 35 of the civil procedure rules which govern expert witness work, and it sets out very clearly what an expert report should contain. Um, Number one, expert evidence should be independent. It's, it sounds very obvious, but um, I've seen so many reports over the years which quote verbatim from other reports. Judges don't like reading 60 or 70 page reports. They like a concise summary of the facts, summary of an opinion at the end of a report. Um, they don't really want an extensive quotation of, of lots of other expert evidence. So um, in the event that you do have to summarise somebody else's opinion, say it reference it, quote it, and say what the source is. Um, secondly, the expert should assist the court by providing objective, unbiased opinion and expertise. We'll come on to see in recent cases, actually, just how a couple of experts have come unstuck um, with, with that uh, principle and the rules, um, and how they were then subject to, to criticism by the judiciary, um, which is, uh, is certainly unhelpful and, and, and not where you want to be. And thirdly, experts should consider all material facts. It sounds obvious. I say review everything. Um, I say transparency, um, cards on the table is always the best approach in expert witness uh, cases. By way of example, um, you presented an expert um, when you're preparing an expert report with huge amounts of medical records sometimes. It's easy to, to perhaps miss a, a few entries or not comment on everything that might be directly relevant, but I, um, I think it's essential that every single record is commented upon, if even remotely, um, remotely relevant simply on the basis that um, you pull the rug from under your opponent's uh, feet, really, if you're able to, to say, I've seen everything, and this is my opinion, and my opinion will not change. Absolutely key that you've, you've seen everything. Um, we deal with everything head on. Um, because simply, um, or put simply, if we, we miss something in, in a record or don't comment on a specific document, then uh, you, you can be sure that an expert or a judge will pick up on it and, and think that we're trying to hide something. So... Absolutely key. The rules continue, and um, I won't read them all uh, out, but um, 
just 2.4a, when a question or issue falls outside the expert's expertise, um, top tip, if anybody ever gives evidence at trial, the first question that you will be asked by a barrister in cross-examination is about your level of expertise. What we do is we'll get your CV, so make sure your CV is up to date before you give evidence, and we'll go through it with a fine tooth comb, and the first question will be, tell me about your level of expertise in, or tell me the last time you treated a patient with. And the aim of that, of course, is to try and undermine the expert's evidence before it's even begun. So us lawyers are a bit of a sneaky bunch in, in, in that way, but we try and undermine the credibility before somebody even get, even get started. So um, if it's outside your expertise, don't, don't comment upon it. So I've um, seen so many times in reports where I'll have a comment that will say, although not within my area of expertise, my view is that. And it's, it's a waste of a sentence because it just that first part of the sentence undermines the second and uh, it, it gets us nowhere, and judges just don't like it. Um, secondly, I've said, if you're not able to reach a definitive opinion, say so. Well, that, that sounds very obvious, but uh, the test we use in these cases is called the balance of probabilities. Balance of probabilities means, is it over 50%? So is it 51% or over? So your view on the balance of probabilities is that this is likely to happen. If it's 50-50, don't say it. Sounds obvious, but if it's 50-50, say, I need to see the patients again in six to 12 months' time or however long it will take to offer a view. Um, finally, if your opinions change, obviously you, you, you need to, to say that. What are the instructions? Now, there are three types of instructions in any case, and it's important really to, to know what you're being asked to do. In most cases, the, the first, the single, uh, or the separate expert rather, will be the role that will be adopted by, by most of you, which examining one claimant, what one patient reporting to one part in the litigation. In, um, in less complex or less contentious cases, you may be a single joint expert, and that's a very important distinction because a single joint expert reports to both parties. Um, you can't have communications just with one, it has to be with both. So a single joint expert has a responsibility um, to communicate simultaneously to both parties, and it's absolutely key um, that you're aware of the distinction and, and how you're being instructed. An advisor or shadow expert is, is a lot less common, which is, is generally it's a, an expert who comments not on procedure or, or, or within a, um, in a report which complies with the rules, but rather um, commenting on the clinical inputs um, which has been provided and commenting on the extent to which that's, uh, that's reasonable. Um, terms of instruction, it's again very obvious, but, um, but very clear that the solicitor should be instructing you um, very carefully to say, the capacity you've been instructed in, the, the services required, time scales which are important, the basis of the expert's charges as well, because um, in all cases in which court proceedings are issued, um, we have a procedure called costs budgeting, whereby the lawyer will appear before a judge and the judge will look at the case phase by phase, one of those phases being expert reports, and the judge will say, you lawyer can spend £20,000 within that particular phase. Now that means the lawyer's costs, the expert's fees, all have to come within that £20,000. So absolutely important that you agree a fee because of course if the £20,000 runs out, the lawyer's in difficulties as to who he can afford to pay. Terms of instructions continued, um, all very obvious, um, but certainly worthwhile bearing in mind. Um, I mentioned at H, time for making the payments. Um, is it conclusion of the case? Well, I settled a case a couple of weeks ago. It went on for five years, and that's not in common with very complex um, litigation. Um, most of my eight or nine experts had agreed terms and conditions with me beforehand, payment within the 30 days of delivery of the report. Those that hadn't um, waited five years, so always get your terms and conditions, or it's a long wait. Um, always agree them um, before you start any work. Now, I mentioned briefly something called the Civil Justice Council. Even a lot of um, solicitors don't know that these rules exist, but the Civil Justice Council provide guidance which uh, is incorporated into the civil procedure rules. Um, that means that lawyers have to follow them in civil litigation and personal injury and medical negligence. And the rules are very, um, I've not set them out here, I can circulate them of course, but the rules are very clearly defined as to what should go into a letter of instruction to an expert, and if you get a letter of instruction that doesn't contain all of this information,
then you should be flagging it up and saying, I need this. So um, the often overlooked, but basic information such as names, addresses, telephone numbers, purpose of the reports, um, description of the case itself, um, witness statements, and uh, in particular which documents are in draft and which aren't, because um, lawyers have a tendency to sometimes send documents to, to a neuropsychiatrist or other experts and say, comment upon this particular document, only to, to say, well, it's draft, I'm going to change it at a later date. Um, dates of hearings, because when a court um, gets hold of a case, case manages a case, there will be a timetable set, and the timetable will say, the neuropsychiatry report needs to be served by this date, um, and we have to comply with it, or we have to go back to the judge and explain why. Um, so don't be caught unawares by court deadlines. And then the budget for the, uh, for, for the expert report fee, which comes back to the point as to how important it is, really, to agree fees before you start any work. Are you the right expert? If not, say so. Um, don't discredit your evidence before it's been written. And, and, and I go back to the CV point, I suppose, or, or the point in, the, in the, the report which says, outside the field of my expertise, but I think that um, it's, 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 it's not the, the right way to go and it will not do, uh, do your credibility any good at all. Um, identity of the parties. I'm going to come on to briefly mention a case which was before um, a High Court judge a couple of weeks ago whereby um, there was a conflict because um, the parties or the expert wasn't clear at the outset as to whether he knew anybody else in the litigation. So do you know the patient? Do you know the other doctor? Do you know the treating doctors? Um, and what documents do you have? Are they all there? If they're not there, ask. Um, otherwise, I think you're on the back foot because if you come to, to, to a joint statement stage, which I'll come on to explain, um, and you haven't seen the documents, it immediately puts you on the back foot as to try and to, to, to make sure that document doesn't undermine what's gone before. Um, I always say the most important document in any um, litigation is a witness statement. We need to see what the patient's saying about the pre-existing, pre-morbid history, um, what's happened in an accident, and what injuries they've suffered, and what symptoms are suffering now. Um, you have so little time to assess the claimant um, in, the, in the, the half an hour or an hour that you have allotted for the appointment uh, sometimes that the witness statement is key. If there isn't one in the instructions, I always say ask. Ask for one. I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, Timescales continued. Um, be clear, as I said earlier, about setting out when you're going to report, when you need to see the claimants. Um, does it comply with, with court deadlines? It says limitation. Well, there's a, a three-year period generally for the issue of court proceedings from, from a date of an accident. Um, Make sure you don't fall foul of that because the lawyer has to use a medical report to issue court proceedings. So without one, um, we're, we're stuck. So don't be afraid to ask for clarification as to what the instructions should be, but in particular, when and how. Now, after me telling you all about the prescriptive rules and what the report should contain and what the letter of instructions should contain, bizarrely, there's no rules at all um, regarding um, examination of the patients or, or claimants. The rules are completely silent doesn't say how long it should last or what format the question should be, where it should take place. Um, I think it's a matter of common sense, um, so as not to, to lay yourself open to criticism. Um, with a brain injured uh, patient, I'm sure um, everybody agrees that it's crucial they have a, a family member or support worker there or chaperone. Um, keep written notes. Question arose in one of my cases a few years ago: Are the written notes that you take in the assessment disclosable in the litigation? Because we were asked for a copy. Um, the answer is we don't yet know. Some judges um, may well order that those notes become disclosable. So make written notes, keep the written notes, because if there's ever a dispute as to what the patient said, um, they're there to protect you. Um, recording. This is a, another issue which arose a number of years ago, and not one of my cases, but um, a, um, a patient turned up to a it was a psychiatric assessment, actually, and um, surreptitiously recorded the whole assessment process um, without the knowledge of the psychiatrist examining, exam examining him. Um, there was then a dispute as to what was said when the report came out, and um, the, the patient produced this recording, which actually undermined a little bit about what the report said. So if you're ever asked, can we record, my, my view would be, be no. Um, but um, but you know, be aware it does happen. Now, the report contents, moving on to, to the report itself. You've assessed the claimant, you've delivered the report within the agreed timescales. Um, addressed to the court, every, 
expert, and, and this is enshrined in the rules, has a duty of independence to the court. An expert does not write to the party instructing them, does not, I say does not write, does not address the report uh, in particular to the party instructing them, but rather impartiality to the court, there to assist the court. Um, details of those relevant uh, qualifications. Um, I mentioned earlier about the length of a report and, and how frustrating it is for judges sometimes to, to, to read um, very long uh, reports. And what tends to happen is that when we have cases that go to trial, there'll be a huge amount of trial bundles, documents about the case in front of the judge. A lot of cases settled before they reach trial and the judges are extremely busy. So a lot of them don't have time to read through these huge bundles of documents. So they tend to skim read the documents and what they will often do is just read the conclusions of some of the reports. Um, if there's a very long report, they'll, they'll, they'll skim read it really most of the time, perhaps do some of the judiciary a bit of a disservice there, but I think the vast majority will just skim read uh, some of the reports. So if it's too long, it probably won't get read. Um, if you are going to refer to any other expert opinion which may be relevant, I'd put them in an appendix at the end of the report. I think uh, a long report quoting verbatim from other reports is just isn't necessary. I think uh, a punchy report with good conclusions and a summary at the end with an appendix at the end which sets out what other experts have said, if needs be. Um, and finally, the statement of truth is a document or a statement that appears at the end of every single expert report to say that you've complied with your duty. If you don't set out that statement, the, um, the report isn't valid at all. It's not uh, acceptable within the rules. So, report continued and confirmed who carried out any assessments or tests and who it was. Um, I've said summary of conclusions again. Um, it comes back to really that the judges don't often read um, large um, amounts of reports, but if they've got a punchy summary, what's your view, why is that your view, and what have you considered, that's very persuasive and very powerful. It sounds obvious, but... Uh, it's not always complied with, and sometimes we find a summary or the findings hidden away in the body of a report, which makes it very difficult to, to read. Um, set out at the end of the report that you've complied with your duty to the court um, and that you're aware of the Civil Procedure Rules Part 35. Amending reports. Why do we do it? When do we do it? Um, well, the answer is it's perfectly acceptable as long as your report's in draft. Um, what solicitors will do is we'll ask you to assess a patient and ask you to produce a report in draft, and the draft report will then be discussed in a conference where the solicitor or barrister will ask you to perhaps expand on your views and perhaps um, add in some more detail if, um, if you're in agreement. Well, um, that's perfectly acceptable, um, provided the report is marked and treated as a draft report. If it's a final version, then it shouldn't be amended. Um, I say when, uh, before service, once the report is served, on, uh, on the other party, it's, it's, it cannot be changed. It's fundamentally uh, cuts out the bag and, and, and that's the report. It cannot possibly be changed. Now there's a, an eminent QC that has been doing catastrophic injury work for, um, for tens of years. And he writes a blog and he wrote a blog a number of years ago called Selection of Experts in Catastrophic Cases. And um, in particular, he described the difference between winning and losing um, a case. And he said, good experts help us win cases, bad experts damage or lose them. So uh, that's just how crucial the expert report is to the whole litigation process. Good experts keep us out of court and, and, and help us win the case. Questions to experts. Well, each party is permitted to, to ask the other party's expert questions. But these questions must be for the purpose of clarification of your report. On a case I've, uh, I've been dealing with recently, we had four or five pages of questions um, to our neuropsychiatrist asking our neuropsychiatrist to comment on um, what the claim, how the claim presented at the time of the assessments. Um, had the neuropsychiatrist con considered a certain um, email communication between the claimant's wife and, uh, and a GP? And um, all of that, we say, is not asking for clarification of a report, but it's cross-examination and you cannot cross-examine by letter. So any questions you get must be for the purpose of clarification of your report. And if in doubt, uh, ask. Um, I say speak to the solicitor if, if there's any doubt. Who pays? Well, it's enshrined in the rules that the person asking the questions isn't necessarily the one that, that pays the expert's fees. So the expert's fees are always paid 
before the end of the case, but always paid by the party instructing them. So if the other party solicitor asks the other expert questions, it's up to the party that originally instructed the expert to, to pay, not the party asking the questions. That's an important distinction. Now, expert meetings. Once um, expert reports have, have been complete and once reports have been exchanged, we often find in, in the high-value um, catastrophic injury cases, each party will instruct an expert of the same discipline. And what will happen is the two neuropsychiatrists or psychiatrists will then have a joint meeting. So they call it a preparation of a joint report. And the purpose of that report is to set out very clearly where the two experts agree, where they disagree, and the reasons for disagreement. Um, it's very common. Um, it's, it happens in virtually every case um, that, that goes to trial. But what it cannot be used for is an opportunity to introduce new evidence or expand upon your report. So you can't start to use it to say, well, actually, I think this because. Um, it's simply, uh, we agree, we disagree, and this is why we disagree on, on, on these points. Um, we, I say at the end, I say the doomsday scenario, because once we get to the joint report stage, we're very close to trial. If an expert of either party starts to, to row back on, on their opinion, and, uh, and changes their mind ever so slightly, it's uh, disastrous for the lawyers because the case is, is undermined catastrophically and, and probably needs to, to come to an end quickly. Expert meetings continued. Um, ask for an agenda if you're not clear what should be discussed and, 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 and what parameters there should be. Um, if there's no agenda, there can sometimes be an agenda prepared by both parties, but that tends to be unworkable when... Uh, the, the two neuropsychiatrists are working from, from different questions, so uh, I say try and agree on one agenda. And the <coughs> party's legal representatives should never attend these meetings and should never be informed of the contents of these meetings either. <coughs> so tactics and, pra and practicalities. Um, so when we reach the joint statement stage, we're very close to getting to trial. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Make sure that you've seen every document and make sure you've commented on every document, because if not, you're massively on the back foot. Um, if you've not seen some reports that your opponent, uh, neuropsychiatrist at the joint statement stage, says um, is relevant, um, it pr provides for a very difficult conversation, really, as to, as to, to how he can row back and, and how he can say, well, I haven't seen it, but now I've seen it. It doesn't ch cause me to alter my view. It's, uh, it, it's, it puts you in a very difficult situation. So... Make sure you've seen everything. Um, make sure you provide your comments to the instructing solicitor beforehand. Um, that, that's key. Um, say telephone or in person, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, the ownership, this is uh, something we always tell the, the experts we instruct. He who scribes wins. And, and by that, um, when the joint report process starts, one of the experts will agree to be the note taker. We always encourage our experts to be the note taker because for some reason, seem to have the upper hand um, right in the notes. It then goes to the other expert to comment on, but uh, we always say, take the bull by the horns and, uh, and you be proactive and, and be the note taker. Um, without prejudice, discussions between experts are without prejudice, pre prejudice. They are not for discussion, not to go anywhere else. Whatever you say in that discussion must not be communicated to the lawyers. If a lawyer asks you about the contents of the discussion, shut it down and, and say it's privileged because under no circumstances should that be discussed. And that was considered in three cases I've mentioned there actually recently, but um, the courts are very keen to, to say privileged, must, must not be discussed in any way. Um, draft statements, can solicitors see draft statements prepared when you're doing the joint statements? No, is the short answer to that, absolutely not. Um, Continue joint statements, um, once the joint statement is Complete, signed and sent, it cannot be changed. Of course, it's the expert's work. It's, it's not, uh, not any input from the solicitor, so it's your view. You don't need any input from, uh, or don't need authority from anybody to sign it. Um, if you alter your opinion, um, absolutely crucial that, that you explain why, because if not, and you end up at trial, you'll be sure the judge will ask you why you've changed your opinion. So, uh, so be pr prepared to justify it. And finally, disagreement is fine, and um, disagreement is very common in every joint statement we do, but um, be, be clear to set out why. This is key. 
So moving on to pitfalls now, and really these are, are, are tips to, to ensure that, that you get out of the process with, with reputation enhanced or intact, and um, really those things that, that can cause um, doctors and uh, expert witnesses to, to come a bit of a cropper when, uh, when giving evidence or, or even before we reach that stage. And I'll mention a few cases shortly where, unfortunately, um, that has happened before, a, before a, a high court judge. Unclear instructions. Well, be absolutely clear um, what you're being asked to do. As I said earlier, we, we, we saw that list of, of documents and of questions, of information that, that should be included. Um, if it's ambiguous, ask for clarification. That's perfectly acceptable. Any enclosures, the status of reports. As I said, some solicitors have a habit of saying, oh, this is a draft report. Um, we don't want you to rely on it or comment upon it. Well, they need to be very clear about that beforehand, and they need to, to make sure that your report is in draft if you do mention it. And premature reporting. If you're not in a position to, to give a long-term view or you're not in a position to even assess the claimant because you've not seen as much information as you need to, then flag it up. Flag it up. It's, it's absolutely key. Um, now, independence. I, I devoted really a whole slide to this because um, there are three cases mentioned there, which are all cases um, which have been before the court in the last um, three or four months or so. One case I've not mentioned is it's called, uh, a case called the Icarian Reefer case, which is um, really the case um, whereby um, expert reporting was considered very carefully by the judge. And the judge in that case was very critical of, um, of an expert, um, and the judge held that a misunderstanding on the part of some of the expert witnesses contributed to the length of court proceedings. The judge then sat out in his judgment the duties and responsibilities of expert witnesses. So you don't want to be that doctor mentioned in that judgment because it was very critical. Um, so moving on to, to, to these three cases, um, that Piri Piri uh, Limited, um, that um, is a case uh, a couple of months ago actually whereby um, the judge uh, held so it's not part, it is not part of the duty of an expert to advance the case of the party instructing them, whether by advancing arguments of fact or law which are outside their expertise, or seeking to present that party's case in a favourable light. So again, very clear, the judge um, were, were, went to, to, to town and highlighting the need for independence and transparency, um, uh, and said it's not the role of the expert to, to, to act for that, as the advocate for that particular party. Uh, the case of Flanagan was uh, very similar, actually. Again, the judge focused uh, very much on impartiality and independence. And the case of O'Leary is actually an Irish case. It shows that uh, this idea of independence and impartiality is not just confined to, uh, to England and Wales, but uh, in the Supreme Court of Ireland case just a couple of months ago, a judge referred to a fundamental duty of independence and impartiality of experts. Um, I mentioned earlier about um, disclosing interests, and there was a case called Toth and Jarman, which was before the courts about three or four months ago. And in that case, um, the uh, examining expert um, happened to, to know, as a, as a friend and colleague, uh, a doctor that had treated the patient, um, failed to mention it at all. And when the case went to trial, this was raised by, uh, by the, the barrister, um, and it discredited and undermined that expert's uh, Evidence, not necessarily because there was any question that it wasn't an impartial view, but just that, that whiff of, of, of lack of, of transparency because he hadn't uh, disclosed it. So if there is any interests, any conflict, then flag them up right at the outset. Finally on this slide, competence. Um, be sure to remain within the limits of your expertise and make sure you're up to date. Again, coming back to the CV point, really, that if you're ever giving evidence, that will be the first question you're asked about uh, about your level of expertise and when you last treated the patient with a particular, a particular um, diagnosis. Um, one question which barristers really like to, to ask is, is a lot of people that do medical legal work are often retired from NHS practice and the, one, of the, one of the most common questions will be, well, you retired from NHS practice in whenever, tell me how you keep up to date with current medical practice and um, tell me when the last time you saw a patient was. Um, so, be prepared and be, be aware that those questions are coming and make sure your CV's up to date so you can bat them back. Experts meetings, change of stance. We've touched upon this briefly, actually, the, uh, that what will happen 
um, if you change your opinion. Well, if you do change your opinion at any stage, be just, just be prepared to, to justify it. Um, again, the duty to the court is, uh, is paramount above everything else, above um, any duty to those instructing you. Um, Timescales and summons for trial. If anybody's had the, the unfortunate experience of being summoned um, to appear to give evidence as an expert witness, it's massively frustrating um, for a doctor because um, what we do is, is we have a, a, a trial um, which might take place over uh, 10 days or so, um, and we'll send a summons and say, we want you to appear at trial between the 4th and the 15th of November, or whenever it might be. We don't actually tell you when that might be. Hugely frustrating because you're all very busy. You've got your NHS or private practices, and you can't afford to block out two weeks in your calendar on the basis that you might go to trial on one of those days because, inevitably, it will only be one day, um, or possibly two, but uh, to, you know, it certainly won't be for the whole time. So, hugely frustrating. So, it's perfectly legitimate to ask the lawyer to say, when am I going to give evidence? What day um, am I likely to be required? Because when we prepare cases for trial, we prepare a timetable for trial at quite uh, an early stage. It's at least two or three months before the trial itself. And that timetable will set out when we think certain doctors will give evidence. So ask for the timetable because it's completely unrealistic to expect you to, to block out two or three weeks just on the basis to, that, that you may be needed for one day. Um, differences, differences between witness and expert evidence. Just a, a minor point, witnesses in, in a court case uh, cannot offer an opinion. It's inadmissible. Experts, of course, can. That's what we ask you to do, offer an opinion on the balance of probabilities. Tips in giving evidence, um, always objective, never ever um, become the advocate for one of the parties as we've seen in these cases, um, always objective, um, don't be bullied by an aggressive uh, barrister and cross-examination trying to get you to change your view, it's up to the court to decide um, whether you're right or not, realistic about timescales of course and that counts for not only uh, writing a report but also um, timescales for, for a patient's long-term recovery or further treatment. And we say hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Well, I think the statistics say about 96 or 97% of cases never end up at trial. So it's very rare. I've got a, a case this year going to trial. I've not had one for a couple of years. So it's, it's quite unusual now for the cases to go to trial because they tend to, to settle before we get there. But we always say that the best prepared cases never go to trial and the cases the worst prepared cases do more frequently. So um, the better prepared, the better the report, the stronger your opinion, the, the, the more documents you've, you've reviewed and commented upon, the less chance you'll end up giving evidence. Thank you. Are there any questions at all? Thank you. OK, so in... Um, in, in high value or complex litigation, um, what we tend to have is we have a, a claimant, somebody who's injured, and of course um, a defendant, so somebody defending the case, which is often an insurance company or a solicitor. Um, as a claimant lawyer, which is what I am, we will instruct um, a neuropsychiatrist or psychiatrist to assess our clients and write a report. Similarly, the insurance company will do the same thing as well. So, all right, very legal speak opponents, but what I mean by that is the defendant insurer uh, will instruct an expert. So you tend to have two experts of the same discipline. Okay. Sorry. Yes, yeah, that's right. So what will happen is that the two experts will examine one patient. Um, each will produce a report, and often those reports... Um, don't reach the same conclusion. And the experts will then speak to what they call their opponent, so the other experts of the same discipline, and prepare the joint reports, which we've seen. Right. Would you be Yes, <laughs> it ha sadly it does happen. It does happen, and, and this is often why we, um, we we speak to our experts in conference. And if our expert says this is my opinion and this is why I've reached this opinion, um, the solicitor should accept it. But 
it's not unheard of. It's, uh, it's not unheard of that we'll then go um, and try and find somebody else. They call it um, expert shopping, and um, judges uh, absolutely hate it. And if a judge finds you've um, been expert shopping, the judge can order you to disclose that first unfavourable report. Um, so it's, yeah, frowned upon. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. There is a balance because, of course, you don't want to, to lay yourself open to having missed anything at all. Um, I think that often what works well is, is an appendix setting out the relevant medical records. So that enables the, the judge in particular to be able to read your conclusions and then, if needs be, refer to the appendix with the records um, commented upon rather than all of it being in the body of one report. So I think that sometimes works well. But I agree it is a, it is a balance and especially in your field of expertise, the reports do tend to be much longer than, than say, I would expect an orthopaedic surgeon's report to be. Yeah, hi. Um, in Australia, we're often asked to comment on videos of people wandering around and doing stuff under surveillance. Yes, yeah. Um, but I don't know whether that happens here, but do you comment on how to approach that if you're asked to comment on yeah. video surveillance of patients? It's very, it is very common. It does happen here. Um, the, the difficulty with surveillance is that it will be often served very late in the day, so that the typical tactic for an insurance company who wants to rely on surveillance will wait and wait and wait and will hold the surveillance back until they see the report that you've prepared that says the patient says he can walk so far or the patient says he struggles with this, and they will then serve the surveillance once they've seen the report to say, ah, but the surveillance shows that he's not doing that. It puts you in a very difficult position because... Um, it can often undermine what the patient has told you, um, but you have to comment upon the, the surveillance very clearly. But what's very good practice and what we always do is when we get served with surveillance, we will sit down with the patient and take a very detailed witness statement saying what they're shown doing and why and what the effect was before that statement and the videos go to, uh, to our expert. And the relevance of that is that the surveillance is often edited footage which just shows, shows a snapshot and it may show somebody... Uh, doing something, uh, and then it will cut out. We don't know what the consequence of, of, of that might be, the, the fatigue or the, uh, the, 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 the you know, being housebound then for the next two or three days because they've pushed themselves to do something. So um, I think it's absolutely important that there's witness evidence as well saying what the consequences and what the background of that surveillance is because I think it can be misrepresentative because you can't see pain on, on that's, surveillance. That's actually really good advice because what I'll do now is it's not uncommon not yeah. So from now on, what I'll do is I'll say, I need to re-examine the patient. If yeah. it's not a lawyer's uh, witness statement. Absolutely. Absolutely, because it's a, it's a whole presentation in itself about surveillance because um, what we, we, we have is we, we get sent a lot of edited footage, which might be half an hour, an hour. Um, there'll also be in the background about six or seven hours of unedited footage um, who's to say what's relevant and what isn't? Well, it's generally the insurance company that have selected which bits are relevant and which bits they aren't, and, and we may have missed something. So um, it needs forensic examination surveillance. I don't think it speaks for itself. And the other problem is, of course, you might have seen the patient three or four months ago. Yeah. You've then provided them with expert evidence, so they've seen it, so therefore they now go, they now go and get treatment, which is appropriate, which they haven't got before. Yeah. And then the surveillance appears three months later, when they've actually gone through treatment, yeah. And actually than they were before. How do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Again, the, the witness statement is key in this, or the reassessments, as you, as you say, because um, things do change. Um, patients have good and bad days, don't they? And, and it needs to, to really be, uh, be, be set out in a witness statement. Otherwise, um, otherwise, I think you, you can't comment upon it, because I don't think it can sit by itself, the surveillance. I think it needs a, a background to it and a bit more information. So I agree. Thank yeah.
Yes. And then you get pressed for the report. Should you absolutely say, I'm not going to write anything because I have everything up to date? It's, it's a, a difficult, um, it's, it's difficult question to have, isn't it? A difficult conversation to have with the solicitor because the solicitor may, might want the report for a particular deadline, but, but my view is that you, you need to see everything because um, it puts you on the back foot. If there's that GP entry um, in those three months that you haven't seen that materially relevant to your conclusions, it, it puts you really on the back foot when you come to write a report that you then have to, to add an addendum to, which, which undermines it a little bit because you haven't seen everything. So it is a balancing act, I know, because of time scales and, and time pressures. My view is that, yeah, I, I think you insist that you see everything. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's about definition of expert witness. Mm. I uh, gave evidence in relation to fitness to plead. Right. <coughs> fitness to plead. Yeah. Um, a patient was accused of uh, criminal behavior and uh, they had uh, schizophrenia and... Uh, uh, so, the, uh, in relation to fitness plead, I produced my report and uh, gave oral evidence uh, because the judge wanted that. In, oppos in opposition to me was a, a quite experienced forensic psychiatrist. And uh, so, obviously, him against me. So, um, I was uh, uh, on the side of defense and he was for prose prosecution. And the judge asked us to go back and agree between us and disagree between us and then come back, yes. which we did. Uh, and then the point is, I mean, his experience in forensic psychiatry was extensive, and this is what he only did. I'm a you know, psychiatrist. Mm. And yeah. uh, so, but it seemed to me that uh, uh, I was uh, as valued by the judge as he was valued, because he didn't, he didn't distinguish between his expertise and my expertise. Yes. So I'm, I was just wondering, what is the definition of expert witness, and whether you have a gradation of somebody more expert than less expert? So it's just yeah, there's no specific definition in the rules um, at all. So often it comes down to the, well, it almost always comes down to the opinion of the, the individual judge and the judge will hear the evidence and decide whose evidence they, they prefer. Yeah. So whilst you have the barristers trying to undermine the other party's experts to try and say, well, my expert knows more than yours or that has that greater experience, it will ultimately, ultimately be the judge to decide whose evidence they prefer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Shall we make this the last question? Is that okay? Uh, have you got another one at three o'clock? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, in, in some situation where you have uh, you're examining the patient and about to produce a report. Uh, you, 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 there's this lacking in evidence in terms of previous investigation, which is important for uh, making your decision, your opinion. Um, you almost can't give your opinion unless this investigation, which uh, in very rare instance would require admission to the hospital. How do you deal with that? Um, you just say that my opinion is based on the information I have, and this is what I could say. There's be a range of possibilities. Uh, and then advice on the uh, the investigations and, and admission, or you say you can't really give an opinion until it's done? I think the, the answer to that, you'll be perhaps pressurised to, to do the former by, by the solicitors. Um, it would be preferable to do the latter, but, uh, but often that isn't always practicable. So I would just, it comes back to the transparency, transparency point, and, and I would be very clear to say there are a range of opinions, and, and the rules say it's perfectly acceptable to say there are a range of opinions, as long as you say what they are and why you've reached that conclusion. So as long as it's a, a well-thought-out um, view and that you make it absolutely clear that you can't reach an opinion until that hospital admission, then that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, the danger which I've been trying to highlight, I suppose, is, is offering a view which, uh, uh, which isn't based on, on any particular record or, or long-term view, but rather just trying to appease the solicitor or the court by, by giving a view which really you can't support when, when pressurised. So it's, yeah, it's, it's all about the, um, the, the, the backing your opinion up, really, and protecting yourself. Okay. I think uh, we'll need to, to finish to, to move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, I'll, I'll be around if anybody's got any further questions. Um, I'm not going anywhere. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.